be a leader or just a person who can uh, engage the next generation or you have uh, chances where moments of teaching moments with the young generation. Okay, so for me, I'm, I'm a homeschooler. I homeschool my children. So I try to capture all these different moments and to teach them about godly values. So uh, about sexuality education is not just about uh, understanding LGBT or same-sex marriage or having a voice on that. It's about the entire biblical worldview, like what Uncle Georgie said, about uh, sexuality. It's what they watch on Netflix. It's what they watch from the movies, okay, from premarital sex okay, to cohabitation, right, to having, uh, to bring promiscuous, okay, and so on and so forth. Right. So uh, we don't want our children to be discipled by the world or the media, okay? but we want to take back okay, as parents, how do we have practical steps? So this session, we focus on as a parent yourself, educator, what are some of the practical steps you can do okay, on the day-to-day, -day, weekly, or what can you actually execute in your family okay, or in your uh, workplace, in your ministry? how to engage the children on uh, security education. And we are very, very privileged to have uh, Carol okay, to, uh, to be here uh, with us. Okay, so Carol is the international director of uh, Generations of Virtue. So I went up to Google Generation of Virtue and find out what she actually does. Okay, so it's a ministry committed to transforming a culture one family at a time. Okay, it started uh, in the States. Okay, and then she's the national director, international director uh, also in this region. Okay, she's also the Singapore cohort director of the Corson's Fellowship Program. Okay, and this Corson Fellowship Program, it's a uh, um, course for leaders okay, to understand the biblical uh, worldview about many things, not just education, uh, not just uh, on sexuality, but on uh, many, many matters, okay, how to uh, have this worldview and then to engage and to teach our young generation. Okay, and Carol is a fellow center of for media fellow of the center of media literacy. Okay, certified mental toughness coach, and a Maxwell leadership certified youth and family coach. She served in the public service for over two decades. Now oh, that's a pretty long time. Okay, including Infocom with the media and Infocom Tech Authority. MOE, Ministry of Education, and uh, EDB, Economic Development Board. Okay. And she herself, they have two uh, young adult daughters, and she is a devoted mother amid all her ministry. And when I call her, she's uh, uh, very, very busy uh, with uh, teaching, with coaching, and training. Okay. So she and her husband are raising two uh, young adults. So uh, yeah, I think Carol will be the great person, right, to introduce herself and also to lead us in this poll. And uh, the, the floor is yours, Carol. Thank yes. you so much, everyone, for making time. Apologies, I took some time to get back. And thank you, Aaron, for holding the thought. <laughs> All right. So my name is Carol. Thank you so much for making time uh, tonight. Um, in the church space, I serve in uh, three ministries. Uh, uh, I, I wear many hats. <laughs> so I serve in a ministry called Generations of Virtue, starting from the left. Um, I have been serving there for 10 years as a mother myself, grappling with issues of how do I even talk to my children about sexuality. Uh, as I continue to serve in this space and I see how technology shifted the past 10 years, really the, the, the environment that our children are growing up in is so different. Even my daughters, okay, 20 years old, uh, she feels a burden for girls younger than her, uh, which is why we now serve in a ministry called Carlos. Some of you might have heard of it. It's a ministry by young women for young women. Um, I'm very glad to be part of it because I am a Carlos mom. <laughs> I benefited from Carlos. I just uh, recently took leadership of it to see how we can uh, work uh, intergenerationally, pretty much like what Uncle Georgie says, gatekeepers is we do it generationally how can we raise young girls okay girls and young women to live out their godly uh, uh, lives uh, in a very complex environment uh, I also serve in a ministry uh, that equip 
uh, Christians who have a biblical worldview. This is a much more in-depth uh, uh, study. So I'm very much in the education space, though not as in MOE, even though I served in MOE for about 13 years out of my 20 years in public service. I was in the Ministry of Education headquarters, um, not really on the ground as teachers, but I was in different parts of the Ministry of Education. Um, and I get um, front row seats on a lot of uh, educational issues. Uh, and about five years ago, I left the public service and now have more flexibility to serve in various ministries. Uh, and I also run my own social enterprise um, from the outside. Okay, so this is Slido. I think many of you were taking part in it just now. So let me just look at the poll. Okay, so there are seven who participated just now. So um, for those who have not, uh, didn't get to, if you could scan the QR code on the top left corner, you will be brought uh, to this tool. Okay, so that we can get to know each other in the room more. Okay, there are about 55 of us. Uh, let's get to know each other. You know, if we are in a physical space, we would have been able to observe one another, smile at each other. Uh, now we don't really get to do that. Some of us cameras are not on also. I cannot see you. If you can turn on your camera, uh, that would be great. Thank you for those who have turned on your camera. Okay, because we are confronting an issue that is... Uh, culturally sensitive, but here in a safe space, I will encourage us to turn on our camera. Uh, even though this session is recorded, uh, the team will make sure that uh, your privacy is maintained. Okay, so there are 17 of us. This is a live uh, poll that you are seeing on screen. If you have only one machine, not to worry, just go to another tab on your browser, go to slido.com. The event code is sexuality education. Tonight, we are talking about how can we as caring adults or as parents, some of us, I know some of us don't have a child, it's okay, we are all influencing young people in different ways. So let's figure out how we can do that together. So uh, majority of us, 40% of us have got children in primary school. Okay, that's when sexuality education happens. Uh, that is a important season of a child's development. That's when they start to get on the internet a little bit more. And if you're a parent, you would say the whole, everybody is on TikTok, everybody is on Roblox, everybody has a phone, right? So there are all these um, different challenges that come starting from that age. Um, so very glad that you are here. Uh, some of us have got older teens or young adults. Okay, thank you so much. If I could move on to more specifically about tonight's conversation, what are your key concerns about teaching uh, biblical sexuality? Or maybe you're not in a teaching position. Maybe you are in the home, okay? We are also guiding our children, all the young people around us, even for those who, who may not have children, but you might have young people uh, your relatives, your extended family, or your mentee, okay? So what are your key concerns? Keen as many as you can, and many keywords. This is a word cloud, so if there are common words, okay, it would be uh, bigger, okay? So what are some of your key concerns? Perhaps there are many. Uh, let's see whether, you know, in this room, uh, about 50 over of us, right, how... How, what do we have some things in common? Okay, what are some of the things that are age appropriate? Is it relevant to what the children see? Okay, how do we start the conversation? Where to start? Not qualified. Okay, all right. Any more? There are seven. Thank you. The depth, depth means, is it the depth of knowledge? Gender complexity. Yes, it's getting more and more complex um, in this world. Yes, uh, so... Is it too early or too young or too late? A quick answer to that question, since it's a question, um, is if you want to give your child or a young person access to the internet, that is the time that we need to start to talk about sexuality. Okay, of course, there are developmentally appropriate ways for us to broach this when they are very young. Later on, I will talk through very quickly because we do want to have time for conversation. So uh, feel free to keep the questions coming, okay? All right, chastity, purity, uh, right resources. Okay, I'm going to uh, share also quite a lot of resources for you to get started, okay? There are questions also about how do we even get started? I'm not qualified, okay? The qualifications start tonight, Ken. By the virtue that you're investing your time here, Okay, that qualifies you to start to speak life into our young people, to start to make sense and bring clarity to our young people, okay? 
One more question and then I'll jump straight to my slide. Okay, what would help you to be more confident in dealing with conversations? What specifically do you need? Okay, so that later I can be sharper as I introduce certain things to you. What do you, so now that you have shared the concerns earlier, okay, what specifically do you need, right? Otherwise, I'll be, I'll, I'll be sharing with you a lot of things, okay? So don't feel too overwhelmed later when I share with you the different stuff that you can consider to start getting ourselves equipped, getting ourselves, uh, our hands wet involved in this issue. If your child is very young, right? You're not very sure. Let's get into a community where we can discuss things, where we can wrestle with different issues, okay? So many of us are looking for resources, age-appropriate examples. Later on, I'm going to share with you from my own mothering journey, uh, what, how my family have done certain things. Um, I'll share with you concrete steps. Yes, I know parents like concrete steps, not just uh, conceptual ideas, okay? But I will be sharing with you a broader frame so that we can first understand the broad issues and then what are, is the biblical aspect to it, which I believe all of us also would know already as, as Christians, as Bible lovers, how do we map it? I think just now what some of the question was, how do we make it relevant? How do we make it relevant for our kids when they are consuming so many things that seem contrary to what the Bible teaches? Step-by-step -step approach, have fair. Later on, I'll share with you, like the step-by-step -step is really looking at how God designed our children to be. There is a... a, a, a a way that God, you know, uh, children grow that are development. I try to avoid terms, right? But they are developmentally appropriate way, right? In terms of child development, right? Children at a certain age need certain things. They are exploring, they are making sense of the world in a certain way, right? So there's a certain approach for us to take if the children are very young or when they are in primary school, they are exposed to different things. So there is a step-by-step -step approach in that sense, okay? Um, that we can consider. All right, why and how and so on. Okay, very good. Uh, it, it is something that I, uh, I think I will share with the team also so that if there is any follow-up from today's session, today really is a too short time for us to go deep into this topic. I'm very happy to continue to uh, connect with you if you have any questions or you need any resources. So the first, the first few slides, I'm going to first set the stage. Okay, kind of like just to remind us what is the biblical perspective to this issue about sexuality? I know that many of us would already be familiar with it. I'm just going to condense it. You know, I used to do communication, right? Working with the media. Uh, and we always, uh, and I used to write speeches, okay? Uh, and we always say, what are our key messages? Key message means whatever, in whatever way that we say, we always land back to the few key messages. So when we talk to our children, for example, we always want to land in a few broad, baskets as they grow up, we would still reinforce these key messages. So the next few slides is really just to say, yeah, the whole world is very complex, but when it comes to this topic, there are some key things that we want to remind us. These are the things that the frame that we hang on to, regardless of how confusing things are, okay? And so the definition of love, okay? You hear this month is, is a month where, you know, they're different. They publicize different definitions of love. Uh, husbands, love your life, wives just as Christ loved the church. Really, these are verses that remind us, right? When it comes to love, when it comes to sexuality, when it comes to a union, it, sex is meant to demonstrate this very deep union, Right, that deep union, that deep knowing between a husband and a wife is to demonstrate that deep knowing between Christ and the church. We are supposed to know Christ so deeply, just as he know each one of us so deeply, right? And that is love, right? And, and husbands are meant to love our wives just as wives, just as Christ also love the church, the sacrificial love. So, what is God's design for sexuality? Okay, so sex in God's design is meant to be between a married man and a woman. Okay, it's meant to be designed. I know in the questions, there are a lot of questions about, you know, cohabitation, premarital sex. That seems to be very normal now, even for young people in church. Okay, so again, which is why I start off our conversation with what are some of the key things, right? It, it, even if things get very confused, what do we narrow down on and understand why, okay? Why is sex between a married man and a woman 
okay? Because that when sex happens, and I explained it to, to children as well, that sex is meant to bond two people so deeply together on so many fronts. It's not just a physical act. Okay, mm-hmm. later on, if there's time, I show you a, a illustration that I do with young kids to demonstrate how tight sex can be for two people. Right? It's meant to bond two people together, not just in, in the body, but also bond two people together mentally, emotionally. And this deep bond, it's meant to be when a life is created out of this union. Right? When a life is created, the child that is created, like God used this couple to create. This child, when is in a strong marriage, right, in a healthy family, this child will then have the best environment to grow up. And when they grow up, when this child grow up, also find another, right, another a spouse that can bond deeply. And when a life is created, that's how we can be fruitful and multiply. So that's, a, that's God's design. When we go out of God's design, premarital sex, you know, things like that, there are then consequences, uh, which I will cover in another slide because I want to start. And, and when we talk to children, especially, right, we want to bring them first to God's truth. And so some of the things that I'm sharing with these few slides are really the key messages that we want to reinforce from time to time in our conversations, activities with them, right? Um, and, and even, you know, mealtime conversations, some of these things can come out more naturally. Okay, so what is the purpose of sex? So beyond procreation and be fruitful and multiply the blessing that God gave us, it's also meant to demonstrate unity, right? Because it bonds two people together. And it's actually foreshadowing of heaven in the sense that ultimately we know the end game, right? The Bible tells us eventually we are going to be reunited. That deep union, right, mm-hmm. is, is foreshadowed by the act of the sexual union, right? Because it's so tight, it's so united. And that deep knowing, okay, is an element of it is demonstrated by the, the sexual union. And isn't it interesting, you know, uh, sometimes I, I, I tell young children, right, isn't it interesting God have created every one of us by his word, he could have created Aaron. He could have created, you know, everybody by just his word. But he used us, human beings, to create something that could potentially last forever, right? A soul is in our body, right? And then at that soul will ultimately, right, return and be united with God. Isn't it amazing, right, that he can use us human cre- beings to create something that could last forever and be united with him? Isn't it interesting? That sense of, oh, if you notice how I'm sharing this, right? This sense of, wow, you know, God's design is so amazing. This sense of awe is what I would encourage us, right? Sometimes as as adults, we kind of like, ah, this world is crazy, man. Like, how in in the world am I going to raise up my kids in this confusing world? And sometimes it, it can trouble us. And it comes into our demeanor when we talk to our children. But when we can appreciate God's design and have this sense of awe, right? And we want to share with the children the beauty of God's design rather than something that this is like a commandment that you need to follow, you have no choice. But to give them that sense of beauty, right? Wow, if everybody can do this, what difference would it make to our world? That sense of awe of his design and beauty is something that we can Right, as we get to understand and be familiar with this topic, right, we can then more confidently convey this beauty of God's design. You know, my husband like watch, you know, when he look at a Rolex watch, right? Oh, he stand and look very long, and then he'll be in awe, right? Be like, wow, then even I don't really appreciate watch that much. I will also be in awe, right? Wow, this is so amazing, so intricate. But actually, God's design for us. The human body is also very intricate. Isn't it amazing? Because it's so amazing, that's why the enemy will come to corrupt God's design. Sex is meant to be a beautiful thing. It's meant to enable us to be fruitful and multiply and take dominion of the earth that God has given us. But he comes contaminated. So now we have all this confusion. It it doesn't just happen like this. It has it has been happening for decades. Technology shifts, ideology shift, and therefore now when it comes to 2022, what we do and what we don't do will continue to shift culture. The question is, which direction are we going to shift culture to? Is it towards God 
or is it continue to go in the in the di divergent way? Okay, so the enemy comes to corrupt what is good, uh, deceive people out about God's character. Are you sure? You know, if God loves you, God will want you to be happy, right? Then you can do whatever you want. God has given you power, right? You can do whatever you want. There is this whole misinformation campaign that the enemy has gone out on so many levels, on God's identity, on God's character, on what love is. So we are the fact checkers <laughs> for our children. You know, I'm, I'm in the media space, I teach digital literacy and I teach people how to you know, have those skills to see through, have media, be media literate, there are certain skills, right? And maybe in a separate session, I'll be happy to share with you more. This whole misinformation and disinformation campaign by activists, I think this is where we need to bring clarity to our young people, right? Do the fact checking, be the benchmark, right? And, and be winsome as we talk to our children, okay? So as we talk about this issue about sexuality, Okay, it's actually not just about sex. In the past, when I talk about this, maybe 10 years ago when my children were younger, we are trying to figure out you, how do we talk to our children about the birds and the bees? We have gone past way, way past that already. In this day and age when, when technology is so prevalent to children at a younger and younger age, the kind of things that they are consuming, the kind of ideologies that are very subtle, right, in nudging them away from what God's perspective is and God's value is very subtle, which is why you, we see a lot of things that are very confusing. So sexuality is not just about the, the sexual act, okay? It's also got to do with other sexuality-related things that can shift and shape the mind about what sex is. So pornography is one of the key things that... Um, that we battle with, and I actively uh, work to battle this, both in the church space and the secular space, because pornography really is a misinformation platform about what sex is. It demeans the value of sex, it drives sex trafficking, it impacts our brain, it impacts our relationship, okay? So, so there's a whole effort to counter that. At the same time, young people think, that pornography, there's nothing wrong with it. It's something that I consume in private. So what's the problem? But actually it is not, nothing is private when it comes to the issue about sex and how we take care of our body. Okay, cohabitation. What is the problem with cohabitation? If I'm very serious with my boyfriend or girlfriend already, why can't I travel overseas with my friend? It's cheaper, isn't it? It's cheaper, you know, I can stay in one room. I don't have to put pay two rooms, right? Uh, and things like that. But at the same time, we want to also discuss, and later on, I'll share with you some of these groups that we can, you know, uh, get ourselves equipped into. How do we even broach this topic with young people or even with our family and friends, right? That cohabitation, we think that it's a testing, uh, test whether we can, we can get married or not. But actually, it is setting ourselves up for failure because cohabitation does not forge commitment. When marriage, if the goal of cohabitation is to test whether you want to get married and the end goal is marriage, right? And then we, we should also talk about what's the purpose of marriage, right? I've got two girls, 20 and 17, and we talk about dating and marriage very often since they were very young, actually. What is the purpose of dating? In my family, where right, we talk about dating, it's actually to, to get to know the other person better with the end goal, we always be begin with the end in mind, right? The end goal is whether that person is somebody that I would be willing to commit my life to and whether that person is willing to commit his whole life to me, right? Because when we talk about sex, it's such a deep level that I do not want to give my whole self to anybody, right? I only want to give all of myself to someone who is also willing to give all of himself to me. And so the goal of dating uh, it's for marriage and it is for marriage. Then what are some of the things that we can do to make sure that our marriage can be as strong as possible? Cohabitation is not one of those things. Okay? It doesn't help with the sense of commitment because we know that anytime you, 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 things don't work out, you can walk away. That is not a practice towards marriage. Okay, maybe that's why I have no concrete research, but I wonder sometimes whether this prevalence, this normalcy, amongst our young people that it's okay to cohabit, right? It's okay to live together. Save money, uh, if I hang out late at night, right, I don't have to travel home, the grab so expensive. Might as well just sleep. Uh, and since I'm sleeping, 
uh, one night already, might as well just, you know, it's nearer to my workplace. Uh, so things like this, right? So it's a conversation that we need to have. Then of course, there's this whole issue about same-sex attraction. Is it part of God's design and so on? And not just same-sex attraction. You know, many years ago, it was focused on is it gay, is it lesbian and so on. But now it's shifting even more to transgenderism. And I, because I work with young people, I work with teachers, I, and we hear it at a younger and younger age. So if you have a child, and many of you have got primary school going kids, at 11 or 12 or even 10, they are already exposed to, is it bi? Is it lesbian? You know, maybe I'm bi, you know, right? And, and so we need to get educated on some of these trending issues with our young. Where do they get their ideas from? Okay, a lot of things have got to do with what they are consuming. So um, layering uh, how we deal with media is another related topic, but we won't cover tonight. Coming back to God's grand story, okay, coming back to our role. So uh, if we just pause, and this is something that I show to young people as well when I talk to them about sexuality, is we, we need to understand what role are we in God's grand story? Right? We know that the Bible tells us this whole story. There are four acts. Right? In the beginning, God created everything. He said it was good, including sex. But then sin, sin came into the picture. We were fallen, but Jesus came, died on the cross for us and redeemed us. And ultimately, we are meant to be reunited with him. Our citizenship is in heaven. So why are we, why, where are we now? Right? We are here. We have been saved, but we have not been in complete union. Back to Christ, we are given a task, okay, of ministry of reconciliation, not just a task, it's a ministry. All of us are meant to reconcile others back to Christ. For us parents, we reconcile our children back to Christ, right? We reconcile to our fathers. And in the issue about sexuality, how can we then be winsome and reconcile and be relevant, okay? And this is what we're going to talk about as well. So if I have given you that broader frame in terms of what the Bible says about it, and I think many of us already are familiar with that, now I'm zooming in to understand how God has designed our children or the young people around us, okay? This, uh, the, the brain is not a walnut, okay? It's brain scans, okay? If this is the brain over time, regardless of race, language, or religion, regardless of which country, right? The human brain takes time to mature, Okay, the brain grows from back to front. The last part of the brain that develops is the prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for executive functions and things like that. So some of the questions talked about, oh, my children don't have self-control. How do I teach you know, self-control and managing desires? Uh, it's not that easy, not that intuitive, because the part of the brain that does that is precisely but the part that only matures when they are mid-20s, okay? So for those of us in primary school, it doesn't mean that when they go to secondary school, then that's it, you know? It's the school's job, their friend's job, the church job, I am done. No, no we have still got a long way because their brain only fully matures in mid-20s. We, uh, we just need to engage them in different ways, right? Ask good questions, keeping tab uh, on their media use and things like that. So I wanted to just lay this first because when we talk about sexual development, okay, in terms of sexuality, how does a child grow, right, in this area? Uh, not just cognitively, yes, uh, the brain grows, it, 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 we can learn numeracy, literacy, but in the area of sexuality and identity, what are some of the developmental ways that we can consider? Okay, so... Okay, this one looks a little bit crowded, but you can see the uh, write-up, a much fuller write-up in the various QR codes that I put here. This is from Focus on the Family in Canada. It's one of the best uh, uh, guides that I have come across in the way that they have classified uh, and they have broken down into key baskets of development of the children. And as they break down into different age groups, right? So when they are zero to four, it's a season of preparation. When they are five to eight, okay? It's a season that we can teach them about prevention, prevention of certain things. When they are nine to 12, they have much more responsibility. They are able to think better, right? But uh, we, that's where we want to start the foundation of stewardship. How do we take care of their body? And then at 13 to 18, 
how do we then un- help them to understand the fulfillment? What does it mean to feel fulfilled as they find their identity, right? And this, as they go through developmentally a season of individuation, where they step away a little bit further away from daddy and mommy and try to find their own place in the world, their own identity. And this whole issue about identity is what we need to be really be careful of because we are in a battle of our, for our children's identity whether it's sexual identity or whether it's identity as a person. And actually, when they talk about sexual identity, it has got to do with what they see, what is a person, what is personhood. So anyway, let me go through very quickly what the, this is, okay? So on, the, on the, the different roles, it lays like, first, what is the foundation? What is the core thing for that particular season? And what is the goal? And what is the focus? What is normal during this season? What are some developmental tasks that we need to uh, develop during this season? And how do we foster sexual health? Specific examples. I don't have space in one slide to do that, which is why I have put it in the QR code. So zero to four is to teach the good stuff. Before we overwhelm children with the complexities, we need to give ourselves time to teach them what is correct, what is true, what is beauty. Right, And the best thing is when they are young, very young. It's not too early to talk about sexuality. It's not too early to talk about male and female. Right, they will, we, we leverage on their curiosity about science. Right? Oh, where do cats come from? Oh, that's a mummy cat and daddy cat. You know? uh, and, and so on, right? Use science and just introduce male and female. Then we can introduce, well, in the beginning, God created us male and female, boys and girls. God gifted us male and female. We are, we are you know, we are a girl. It's a gift from God. And, you know, even when we are in mommy's womb, right? You know, in mommy's womb, God already made us. Okay, I'm talking to you as though you are zero to four years, okay? <laughs> Uh, okay, yeah. Some of you have got preschoolers, right? And, and you know, it, when we are in mommy's womb, we have DNA, you know, the very small things that is the boys and girls are different, you know. Boys, they have got XY chromosome and girls have XX, okay. So these are things that there are actually materials that you can use to read together with your child and develop that sense of awe and beauty of God's design, okay. And, and that is the foundation, okay. Uh, and so, at that age, they are able to you know, uh, uh, watch what's surround them, right? They learn through observation. And so at that early age, for them to be able to bond with mommy and learn from mommy, you know, what being a woman is and learn from daddy, what does it mean to be, uh, to be a healthy male? Those are very important in anchoring, right? Um, their the children's uh, identity, sexual identity. Is that okay? Moving on to like preschool years and the primary one, primary two, right? We want to teach certain skills for them to prevent uh, sexual abuse. At the same time, balancing between you know, certain things you need to be careful of. At the same time, we want to scare them too much. You know, uh, yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, it will actually be very anxious for them. Wow, everywhere I go, I need to be very careful. Okay. Um, and so I, I leave you to read the QR codes there are really for every age. Uh, for you to read more deeply. This is one of the best. It takes time take time to read and, and, uh, and, and pack them. For 9 to 12, okay? 9 to 12 is a very interesting season. 9 to 12 is a season where they will be exposed to a lot more internet stuff, right? They will be starting their sexuality education. In Singapore, uh, sexuality education in school starts when it's, they are 11 at P5. Mm-hmm. So if you are a P5 parent, you would have received a letter from MOE or from the school to ask you whether do you want um, to have uh, opt out or do you opt in, okay? Uh, if it's a single parent, right? It, for role model, it would still be useful to expose the child to a healthy female role, a healthy mother model, right? It could be a friend, it could be a family, okay? So we don't have to parent alone. We're not meant to parent alone, even if we are a, a single parent, right? I would like to encourage us, let's, let's find, you know, a, a village that can help us to raise God's children together, that we don't have to be everything to our child, okay? At 13 to 18, Okay, at 13 to 18, that's where they are going through developmentally a period of individuation. They are trying to find their place in the world, what is so unique about them. And they might feel, uh, because puberty also happens around that season, they would start to feel a little bit unsure of themselves. That's where we, we want to nudge them towards, you know, you, you can be fulfilled without having a boyfriend and girlfriend. 
you don't just because all your friends have boyfriend and girlfriend doesn't mean that oh you have boyfriend and girlfriend means life is complete no our completeness we are truly fulfilled when we are with christ we want to divert their attention their energy towards church towards you know building a health being part of a healthy community and contributing to a healthy community be it in a youth group be it serving in the church be it serving with fellow christians in in school or other ministries right we divert their time and their attention to say hey you know our completeness is not with behavior and then we can also share with them if we are comfortable to share our own experience Right, I share with my children about my experience that you know that I had a boyfriend. I'm very open with them. Of course, not every single detail, right? But I'll tell them very openly that you know, mommy had a boyfriend when I was seventeen, and it was like very traumatic because you know he he was insecure and he made sure that I only you know spend time with him and I cannot spend time with my friends, and that I I lose out a lot of opportunities to discover my myself and my strength when that is a season that they can explore with so many so many new activities that they can explore they can learn guitar they can learn singing they can spend time with their friends to make music together paint together so many things so just now the question about is there a step by step this is in a way the step by step looking at how god has designed our children to be they grow they take time to grow god could have made our children just grow up when they are one year old and then we don't have to wrestle with all this problem but no he didn't <laughs> he has created time for us right for for the children to grow up for the children to grow up so that we have time to nurture to build our relationship with our children for them to for us to build certain spiritual discipline with our children okay are we okay so far can you also again uh let me know with your emoji are you okay 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 y'all prefer to use chat is it also can uh, if you want to use chat just type in yes also can <laughs> whichever way you find comfortable still okay all right Okay, so the next few slides is just to highlight uh, that many of us who are in primary school and it might be new to how sexuality education is taught in our school. So I just wanted to point you to this uh, website. So this is transparent information that MOE provides. Uh, so the QR code is there for you to check out even as I speak, if you want to go and uh, check it out, just go and scan it. Uh, MOE lays out very clearly that all of us play a part to help our children understand sexuality. And, and they, they are very deliberate. They don't say sex education. We are not teaching them to have sex. We are teaching sexuality education, which is a very more holistic way. And if, I don't have time to go through in detail with you, but if you, if you look at... Um, so, so let me just go back to the role first, okay? The role of us parents, okay? MOE says we are the primary role. We play a primary role, not schools. We parents play a primary role in sexuality education, no matter where they get that information from. No matter whether is it online, whatever platform, whether is it from school, right? We are the best person to teach them what is right and wrong. Okay, I'm not sure whether there are any educators in this place, right? But educators, at least from what I understand from my former colleagues and educators I work with, great, right? they their job is to hold space is to make sure everybody get their views heard, right? But the teacher cannot say this is correct, this is wrong for you because they are supposed to hold space. So what is right and wrong, the best place is for us as in the home, share with them what is our family values. And for us as Christians, what is God's value? What is God's design, right? What is good? What is right according to God's design? And if we choose not to follow God's design and God could have, could have made other things in a way that all of us got no choice. All of us must follow, but he didn't. He didn't make us like robots because he want us to love him freely. He want us to choose to love him, to choose to believe him. Otherwise, he could have made us robot, right? Everybody just believes in the same way. Everybody made the same way, but no. So it's our job as parents, caring adults, okay? To teach our children what's right and wrong because that's not what the schools can do, okay? In a class of 40 students, a teacher would have students of varying exposure, students who have got different experiences sexually. It is tough for a teacher. So I would encourage us, let's go partner, you know, the school and let's go figure out. We are actually encouraged to be involved 
okay, we are encouraged, and this is on MOE's website, okay, we are encouraged to ask to sit in, ask only, uh, whether we get or not is another thing, okay, ask to sit in, okay, we are encouraged to provide feedback. So you can actually go to your child's form teacher, I have done that, okay, I, I go to my form, child's form teacher, I say, oh, I've got this letter, can you share with me a little bit more how do you teach it and later on i also share with you the school will actually lay out like what is the syllabus what is going to be covered at which time of the year so that you will know okay all this may not it could have been also as an appendix to the letter that the parents will get at the start of the year to ask whether you want to opt your child out okay so we are encouraged to be proactive in sexuality education Okay, to complement what our child complement, okay, what our child learn in school, we can do the following, right? Initiate to talk about sexuality. And of course, we need to figure out what is, what is the best way to do it. Okay, what are responsible behavior, be open to discuss uh, and be always there. Okay, just as in any other issues with parenting, right? Having an open culture, a strong bond, uh, 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 a tight relationship helps, especially in the area of sexuality. So as I mentioned earlier, MOE doesn't use the word sex education. Okay, they are very intentional to say we are we teach our children sexuality education because sex is not just an act, the physical act. It includes physical, emotional, social implications, right? There are societal implications. They talk about social norms and ethics and so on. Okay, and so uh, I want to highlight this to you. Right. MOE again is very open to say that in the sexuality education curriculum that we teach your children, there are six guiding principles that we use across our schools. Okay, In the past, they used to allow vendors to come and run certain programs. Uh, some years ago, there were some complications and they now have taken back. So they would select uh, teachers teachers who uh, have taught in the system for a few years, they don't usually pick the beginning teachers. They would uh, select teachers and then train them to deliver the sexuality education. Okay, So six guiding principles, I've highlighted one uh, because I know the previous session before me, some of you might have come to uh, uh, a session where they discussed section 377A about values in our society. So in MOE, one of the guiding principles is that the sexuality education curriculum is aligned with our national values that encourages heterosexual married couples to have healthy relationship with each other and to build stable nuclear family units with extended family support. Okay, I invite us to think deeper. Okay, why does the government or why is this useful for our country? Okay, beyond we know as Christians, right? We this is what, what God's design is. But if I could invite you to now put on like a marketplace hat, right? How do you articulate it in a way that non-Christian will also agree that this is good for our society? If I could suggest a way, and this is a conversations that later on in a group that I'm going to share with you towards the end, cleaner box conversations, right? We come and wrestle with some of this. How can we bring kingdom principles and articulate it in a way that pre-believers can understand and can agree? Okay, so why why is this useful? Okay, from a government's perspective, why does the government care about marriage? Because they care about marriage because they care about children. Especially in Singapore, you know, manpower is our only resource. Okay, so uh, if, if they can have heterosexual married couples, again, you know, the design, if, if they are healthy, they, if a life is birth forth and a healthy family, then would then take responsibility to raise this life or hopefully from government's perspective, many lives, right? As they raise their family and continue to maintain strong and healthy families, then actually the government don't have to spend so much money to look after families that are dysfunctional. Now, actually, there's a lot of government resources, community resources that are actually taking care of issues that should rightfully have been managed at a family level but because the family fabric is loosening, is breaking, therefore there's a lot of resources now, it causes mental health issues and so on. It flows into the community, it flows into government resources. So from the government's perspective, it, there, there is value 
right? For every one of us to just take responsibility first of our family, do what we can, maintain our marriage, tighten our relationship with our spouse and our children. So these national values actually helps to enable nations to thrive. For many generations, that's what Singapore has been. So I'm just trying to like, pause here for a little bit to, um, to help, it, it kind of like to remind us the importance of upholding the, the national values because that is also shifting. Okay, if you hear uh, uh, those of you who were here in the previous session, things are shifting. When things shift, I'm not sure how long I'll be able to show this slide, okay, with this thing because then they would say national values could be other things. It may not then be heterosexual married couples, family, family is being defined, redefined. Okay, and some of these things are being discussed at school level, uh, positioned as social studies issues, positioned as general paper, kind of a discussion, you know, to expand the boundaries of thinking. Okay, so what I'm trying to say is that things are shifting, that as, as things shift for safety, for survival, we do want to hang on to things that are secure. Right? And, and for us as Christians, the most secure thing, of course, is, is his word, his design. The, most, the more deeply we hold on to that, the, more, the clearer that we can articulate and be winsome to our young people, right? make it relevant for them, the better it is to enable our society to flourish. Okay? Uh, I'm going to move on in the interest of time because I do want to leave a lot of time for conversation. Um, all these are on the website, so I'll take you, uh, leave you to read. There are different ways that sexuality is uh, discussed in the uh, in school. So they do it through subjects, okay, science, biology in secondary school. They do it in CC, correct and citizenship education lessons in primary school. They have form teacher guidance period. Uh, they also have the growing years program, which is a sexuality program. Okay, and for the teenagers, they have a separate program, and in that program, they teach them about protection. They teach them about uh, how not to catch sexually transmitted diseases, okay? So I'm going to share with you, I mean, I've been talking too broadly, right, about broad things. Let me share with you what I did with my girls when they were growing up, okay? So uh, my girls, uh, they know that I share this uh, in my session. So uh, both my girls, uh, they uh, joined me in womanhood when they were 10, Okay, this means that uh, I have to introduce them to like, oh, how do you take care when your period comes and so on. But we make it a point to celebrate, right? And, and we use that, you know, young people learn best when it's experiential. So we take that opportunity rather than just, you know, when I was, when it was my time and I was young, my mom just taught me to make sure I take care of my hygiene and then that's it, right? But I remembered uh, that this is a time for celebration, right? That they are now, wow, their body is ready. Their body is getting ready to create a life that we as women, we have the power to bring life, to bring a baby to this world, right? And that now they're able to do this, but it's not easy, uh, but that's why we want to celebrate, right? So the picture on the left is my husband putting a ring on her finger. Right, and to say the message to her, we always talk about key messages. Right, the message to her is you know, the first ring that's on your finger is from daddy, the next ring that's going to be on your finger is going to be from your husband. From now to the time that your husband you find your husband is going to be a long time, but that's when daddy and mommy and Zaza is going to be with you. All of us journey together as a team, right? And then we make it such a joyous occasion, we celebrate. Uh, same thing for my, this is my older one also. My older one, I was a little bit more inexperienced, lah, you know. <laughs> I have like panic, huh? where to get a ring? Huh? Get a ring. Yeah, but we, we did the same thing. We celebrate it. Take that as an opportunity, right? To say, to say that, you know, we have arrived. It's something that we need to steward. Remember the 9 to 12 is as, uh, it's really steward, right? This is a power that we now have. Let's take care of it. This is something that God has given us. Let's take care of it. It's tough, right? But we have a family to journey with us. And then uh, we, and I'll put it in our family yearbook, you know, to like kind of like refresh our memory. So this happened when they are 10. So I get a lot of questions, right? So if I have a boy, then how a boy don't have, don't have menses, right? How are? Uh? So for boys, so sometimes some families would, uh, also use the age 10 as a milestone of sorts, right? Say, hey, now you're double digit, you know, for the rest of for the many years of your life will be double digit, 
okay, I also used it for my girl like, when she turned 10. Then my girl tell me, mommy, I want you to have three digits. <laughs> I say very good. I hope I will still be healthy when I'm three digit. No, but we make a big deal again when it is experiential, right? They are they turn ten. Wow, this is where we can reinforce the messages like, wow, you know now you are going to be a big boy already. You know you're going to make good decisions. I trust that you can make good decisions when things are tough. Daddy is here for you. Mommy is here for you. The family is here for you. But we trust that you can make good decisions. And speak life, speak blessing. You know, our words have creative power as well. So use those moments. Uh, use whatever moments that you have. It could be birthdays. It could be other half yearly. Be as creative as God leads you to be. Okay. The, the key idea is really find moments in your family's uh, routine, right? Or moments in your child's life that you can harness to spread some of these key messages and sow into them, okay? Um, so at P5, so this is something that you can find in your child's school, okay? Um, you can try this even as you are listening to me, okay? Go to another tab on your browser, go and put sexuality education, and then you put the end sign, and then your child's school, school name. Okay, you click on enter, the search result should be able to land you to a page on your child's school website that would show you the full program. Okay, sometimes if you can't find it, it would be buried within many layers of the school website. You can look for character and citizenship education uh, and then you click further, further, you should be able to find sexuality education. Okay, because uh, every, I believe it's an SOP because this is in every school. Okay, so what I've done is I've pulled out from school uh, what I have not included. Usually what you see on your child's school website is that you would see what is the unit they're covering, what are the lesson, the duration, what is the lesson objective, and on the right, okay, it's when they are carrying that out. It could be term two, week four, whatever. So it's different for different schools but there will always be one, which is why I remove it because it's different for different schools. Okay, some schools will choose to do it at the end of the year. Some schools will choose to do it at the start of the year and get it over and done with it. <laughs> so it's different for different schools. But what is useful is to go and figure out what is your child's school's uh, schedule, okay? Usually this should come together with the letter that you have that asks you whether you want to opt out of sexuality education. And if you opt out, where can we find the relevant resources if you homeschool? Uh, okay, homeschool uh, would have a separate, uh, there are many other Christian uh, uh, curriculum on this. Okay, so if, if you could uh, bear with me, uh, let me cover the uh, mainstream schools first, okay? Because the mainstream school, you can take guidance. I mean, for even for those of us who homeschool and you want to have a sense of how is that taught in, in, in our country, seeing this how it's laid out and how they map up over the years uh, would be useful because once you see this right many actually even many educators or school leaders that I talk to they would find that this one uh, at p5 is already a bit late right we need to talk even earlier so it's useful for us to see it if you think that your child is already more mature already know this we might need to cover more things or, or you might want to uh, you know, talk about some of these issues when they are P4 or even P3, depending on the level of understanding and depending on whether they have older sibling. You know, children who have got older siblings tend to be exposed to more things compared to other firstborns of their age. So again, it's for us to know where our children, uh, what our children need. Okay, so at P5, they talk about uh, puberty, talk about stress and so on. Um, they talk about different kinds of family structure. Okay, I am not sure uh, what that is. I, I haven't been able to find. They talk about gender, male and female, and we don't stereotype gender. They talk about how to protect themselves from um, sexual abuse and things like that. Okay, so that is part of P5, 11 years old. When they are in P6, okay, they talk about love and infatuation feelings, okay, and how to cope with teasing, and then they teach them to deal with pornography as well, okay? So at 
Age 12, uh, this is what I did. There's a resource called Passport to Purity. You can get it from Crew Media. Um, and I, I really appreciate it because sometimes we are at a loss for words. You don't know what kind of vocabulary to use to explain very complex terms, right? So that particular resource have got a guidebook for the young person, have got a guidebook for the parent. And then in the parent guide, right, uh, we got standard answer. So the words in red, right, are the words from us. Okay, so the guide for the young person, this is blank. Uh, so it's for us to guide. There is an audio thing that you listen together and then we unpack it and we talk about it and then they fill in the blank. So the red works actually for us. And it's very uh, graceful and articulate. So what is in the course? What is in the course? Oh, in the course means to communicate. Communicate your love on a very deep level, right? Sexual intercourse is physical joining of a husband and wife in the private areas. It's not, not a man and a woman. Okay, it's husband and wife. So it has got this like language that's already for us. It also has got object lessons, right? Our children learn best through doing things together. So this is my daughter. Uh, eight years ago, my firstborn did this and then she posts. Uh, I, I go through a process with my children where, they, where we co-create content together. And through that process, they learn what is uh, healthy to post, what's not healthy to post. And that composition skills, I do it uh, together with them when they were in primary school. So now when they are teenagers, they have get, got the routine about thinking about being intentional about every post. What is the purpose? How do you make it? How do you, what are some of the things that are appropriate or not appropriate? Um, and so this particular one, this is uh, written by my 12-year-old, her reflection, um, and it's activity about um, uh, matches, you know, and protecting purity. So it's quite interesting. I, I, I won't be, uh, spend too much time on this. Uh, but what I find useful at that point in time is after going through all the conversations and, and uh, uh, the object lessons, you know, we sign contract. <laughs> it's a week to date contract, right? And the contract is to say that, you know, the God, that God holds us, uh, whole parents accountable and therefore, you know, to, to submit to authority and to discuss with daddy and mommy. So it's quite interesting, uh, right? Uh, uh, they may not remember it forever in that sense, that's where we reiterate, right? Remember, we talked about this last time. Remember what is the purpose of dating. Remember that our family is here to journey with each other. So they may not remember that contract itself for years to come, right? But it's, that's not the end, you see, that my point, my point is. Just because you go on a retreat and talk about this, wow, finish already, very good. Oh, that's not the intent. It's for us to have bite-sized conversation as and when they have questions, as and when they see something on TikTok, as and when you see something or hear something, you know, from the news or from newspaper, right, to reinforce some of the key messages that we have built when they are younger. So this was done when she was 12. We continue to have the conversation when she's in secondary school. And now at 20, right, we continue to talk uh, about this. Uh, I don't have time to go through this, but there are 12 steps to intimacy. And sometimes I go through this with young people to say that, you know, sometimes when we see, uh, you know, on the internet, uh, you kiss already and go to the room. Actually, there's a lot of things that happen in between, right? That's where any point in time you can see you, you don't want to stop. Okay, this, uh, let, let's not go any further because once we go, it's like going down a slide. If at the bottom of the slide is mud, right? It's not where you want to go. Then we choose not to go into the slide in the first place, right? Because once you go down the slide, a very steep slide, and you want to stop halfway, it's very hard. So we have to make the decision right from the start, right? Uh, and so these are conversations that we can have uh, with our children as well. Uh, this is an illustration that I have with young children. I asked them to come and demonstrate. You know, hold a bread with jam and another child hold uh, uh, bread with butter, uh, a peanut butter. Then I'll say, you know, this is like uh, a husband and this is like a wife. Again, I, I'm very careful not to use just men and women, right? This is when a husband and wife come together. And when, when they have a sexual union, when they have intercourse, they come together. Then we put the bread together. <laughs> And then I would like, you know, sex is a very intimate thing. Then I would rub it. Then they'll go, ew, ew, it's messy, you know. Ew. Then when they say, you know, the sex act doesn't last forever, right? And when they when they uh end the sexual act, then when I pull over the the sandwich, right? Then I'll ask, okay, right? Can can this bread that was only jam just now? Can I go back to just only jam? Right, then they'll say, no, no, no. Then I said, you know, this one with peanut butter, can I just make this back to just peanut butter? 
now it's like all mishy mashy, right? Because it's messy, right? Then they'll say no. Then I'll say, you know, this is what sex is meant to be. When two people come together, it's not like when it's done, then like, that's it. You know, there are things that happen that bond these two people together. Right? Spiritually, emotionally, physically, it's not just like that. So we want to be very careful who we want to bond with. We don't want to be bond to every bond with everybody. You'll never eat peanut butter. Okay. Yep. All right. Okay. So I am mindful of time. I'm going to like skip some of these like interesting stuff. Uh, uh, this is just to say that um, yeah, build a community that you know, so that our children know that it's just not daddy and mommy, that there are other people who share similar values. And I and this is what I did when my children were 12. Because 12 is like a milestone year for me as well, uh, especially when I had my first born. I found, I tried to find 12 inspirational women for my 12th, uh, for the, my girl's 12th birthday, right? To let them talk to different people, uh, people who, you know, are, are in a space or doing something that they are interested in, for them to see something beyond, right? And then, of course, I'll ask my friends to uh, tell my girls when they were 12, what was it like? What were your goals and vision? To give them a larger sense of the world so that they don't just, you know, rely on what is present. Um, uh, I know this is a little bit wordy, but this is something that you can read a little bit later about the different kinds of educational program, sexuality education program, that there are certain diff two schools of thoughts. One school of thought is sexual risk avoidance, which means there is a certain way, and this is actually uh, where, for those who are homeschoolers, right, there are homeschool curriculum that would take this approach, right? They used to call it abstinence approach, but they now call it like sexual risk avoidance versus sexual risk reduction, okay? It, in Singapore, it's actually more this, than this, right? The, they don't say that much about abstinence from what I understand, okay? It depends on the teacher who carry out because they do teach our children how to manage risk, right? How they put on condoms, how do you keep yourself safe, don't catch sexual diseases and things like that. But I want to highlight this, right? That the view, how we view our young people makes a difference in how we want to teach them, right? This perspective, Okay, sex risk avoidance. This perspective believes that teens can avoid sex and should work for their ideal. Okay, just because a lot of things they are consuming shows that sex is normal doesn't mean that all our young people are like that. Especially for, for the young people who are very convicted, right? They want to live life for the glory of God. What if we come alongside and say, how can I support you, right? In this very tempting environment, how can I come alongside and support you? How can I stand guard and say, no, don't, don't include certain things? You know, how can we protect media and so on? Because the alternative is that, you know, teens cannot, they won't be able to do it one, right? It's a normal part of growing up. It's sexual, experimenta sexual experimentation is part of growing up. Okay, so let's go and support them, whatever that they want to do. Let us go and support them to be who they want to be. Let them have the freedom to be who they want to be. That is the kind of worldview that, uh, that even adults are having. So which approach do we want to take, right? Do we want to take the stand that, for me, right, I have two girls. My stand is that as I continue to build faith in, in, in them and anchoring them in biblical worldview, right, what can I do to help them to have an environment that would not, that help them to work towards their ideal? And if their ideal is to want to work towards God's design, that marriage is something worth waiting for. What can I do as a mother every single day to beef that up? Okay, so I, I won't uh, go through this because again, in secondary school, every year, it's the, the lesson is available on uh, the internet. What I want to show you is though that at SEC2, they teach about gender as well. They teach about sexual orientation. Okay, so at, at 14 years old, they learn about uh, gender role, gender stereotypes, and sexual orientation, which means, I think for some of the parents reading, right, uh, they may not even understand what is sexual orientation. What's the difference between sex and gender? But, but this is precisely where things are shifting and we do need to get informed because this is what is being taught in school, okay? Uh, so this is what I mean by uh, uh, this one, I didn't remove the time period, right? This is where you can see every school will have a different time period, okay? All right, so I'm going to leave you to like, depending on which age your child is, 
I'm just uh, in the next few slides going to share about some resources. Okay, now you have heard like, wow, like a lot of things to do, right? So many things, so many things. Where do I even start? Okay, so let me just share. The next few slides are for resources that are for young people. Okay, apologies, this one is not very sharp, but there is a student guides to culture. This one is suitable for secondary school kids to read. Okay, uh, this Sean McDowell one is really good, relatively new book about chasing love, how to define love, what is real freedom. Uh, young people can read this, secondary school age. If you have a nine to 12 year old, okay, uh, I run, uh, this is a secular program, but I teach children nine to 12 years old, how to stay safe, manage screen time, uh, how to deal with online pornography. And I invite the parents to sit in. Okay, I will engage the parents on WhatsApp and support them on the area of sexuality. And it's free because it's on a paid forward basis. Uh, if your child benefits, then uh, you can choose to pay any amount towards the next batch. So if you're interested, um, you can uh, sign up for the July session. Okay. Uh, Carlos is a ministry that I'm also involved in. The idea is how can we be winsome as we anchor our ch children in their gender identity, in, in, in be being comfortable with, with what God has blessed them with? If God has made us a girl, can we be happy? And how, can we learn to deal with things that are associated that girls have to deal with, right? Instead of, oh, I don't like to be a girl. Maybe, maybe I'm not meant to be a girl, you know. Maybe I actually can transit to be a boy. Maybe all my problems can be solved once I become a boy. That is the kind of narrative that our young people have. And which is why there is this term called rapid onset gender dysphoria. Okay, in the US, a lot of girls during the puberty years, because they start to feel uncomfortable changing body, the breast hurts and so on, right? And then they, they start to have the influencers telling them that, you know, it's okay to remove this. You can have hormone stuff. You're going to feel so much better, right? And so there's so many of these voices so Carlos is, a, is an attempt, uh, it's an effort, it's a ministry that's going on for the past eight years uh, for us to reinforce. So for example, this particular book, we ask young women to come and share their authentic stories about you know, dealing with same-sex attraction, dealing with pornography, and then we compile it into a book and then we have conversations on it. So if you if you're interested, if you've got girls, okay, girls uh, 13 to 17, this magazine in particular, um, highly recommended it. We, we spend a lot of effort to make sure that the issues are current so that we can anchor the, our girls with godly values and put them in a healthy uh, girls' community, Christian girls' community. My girls grew up uh, with Carlos. You know, they started by reading, then they start to contribute. They started to uh, model for them, they draw for them. So it's a very uh, engaging way, right, to get plugged in and stay anchored. For guys, uh, for guys, there's an Instagram account called Philotimo, and maybe later I'll put into the chat, where um, uh, they, they can, you know, learn how to be godly men. Dealing with pornography is a key issue, okay? So just now I showed you about 9 to 12 year olds. Um, how do we get this book? Yes, thank you very much uh, for your support in advance. Uh, you can go to carlos.com. Let me just share with you the QR code. The QR code here would bring you to Carlos. Uh, we really appreciate uh, uh, support in this because it's not easy running this ministry. Uh, we need all the support uh, we can have. Okay, um, so uh, I think I'll move a little bit faster in terms of the resources. Uh, this particular one is uh, Fight the New Drug. Really good for young people. Uh, secondary school and above, uh, even young adults, okay, why pornography is not as harmless as uh, culture says, okay, research has got a lot of, um, uh, uh, you know, there are a lot of research that shows that it's not. These are some books, now moving on to what we adults can do, okay, so just now it's more like what are some of the things that young people can do, these are things that we ourselves can get familiar with the issues on, okay, so some of the latest books uh, I find really useful, um, Rethinking Sexuality, Our Bodies Tell God's Story. This one is a little bit hard to read, but it's really good that, you know, uh, everything is actually written in, in our body. So if we honour biology, honour what God has given us, the world doesn't have to be so complex. Okay, A Practical Guide to Culture is also another really easy to read book. Um, for those with teenagers, or even if you have like 11 and 12 year old, you're preparing for the teenage season, Access is an excellent resource, okay? 
uh, and you can uh, scan the QR code. They have got guides uh, that you can purchase if you are dealing with a particular issue. You can go and look for, let's say I don't know how to talk to my child about LGBTQ. They have got a guide for parents to talk to the kids about LGBTQ. Okay, or if you, if you don't want to subscribe to their membership, just get onto the mailing list. They would give you very current analysis of cultural issues that you can then bring into your family conversation to talk to your children about. My daughter and I uh, serve in Colson Fellows. So this is a deeper 10-month online program designed for busy people. Uh, when I went through it three years ago, I find that it equipped me so much more to deal with my teenagers. Uh, and my daughter just completed her program while she was doing her third year polytechnic education. She finds she came out of the 10 months more convinced, clearer on what she needs to do for God. She was contemplating, should I be teaching or should I go into media? Uh, she came out and out of the room, you know, after reading a chapter in the book and said, you know, I think I need to stay in media. And so now we have been doing things together. And so if you are interested in this program, I'll be happy to talk to you more about what that is. The QR code uh, brings you there as well. And we read really good books, including this book about holy sexuality and the gospel. Okay. Uh, I'm going to skip this. Mama Bear Apologetics. Okay, this one, is, I would recommend it too because it combines apologetics, understanding uh, different worldviews and applying that to the issue of sexuality. Okay, so I run book studies like this so that we can get into, we can first get to read the book, a really good book together and then come into a, a Zoom session where it's not just me talking like this anymore, but I would facilitate conversation amongst the group for us to wrestle with some of the ideas. So if you're interested, come and join us uh, in October. Okay, uh, so that is Christian Conversations. For those of us who might find that, okay, I want, maybe I'm teaching in a school or maybe I, uh, I want to be more equipped. How do I even carry this conversation in a secular space with secular language that I don't, every word come out say because the Bible says so, right? The Kinovox conversation that I mentioned earlier, dissect sexuality conversations into various sections. Um, every time we come together, again, it's one and a half hours on Zoom. We read short articles, uh, and you know short videos and then we unpack so we unpack things like you know cohabitation right what what are the issues we unpack things like surrogacy or egg harvesting right recently you know with a women's conversation one of the recommendation it's about uh, egg freezing so for for a young woman right it is an issue right do i freeze my egg or do i not freeze my egg what is the purpose of egg freezing so these are things as we raise for those of us who are raising daughters Right. These are things that we do want to get equipped in so that we can uh, have a conversation with the children. So if you, uh, if you prefer not to go through every one of these, and it anyway is very flexible, you come for the topics that you are interested in. But if you want to focus just on same-sex attraction, transgenderism, pornography, and sexuality education, I also run a dedicated separate group uh, for them as well. Uh, so if you want to uh, come and uh, join us, uh, it happens on Mondays every fortnight. Um, D6 Family Conference is coming as well in July, so feel free to come and join us uh, as well. We are going to talk about, you know, are we losing the next generation? I'm moderating a panel discussion. Uh, Regardless, so, so some of these things that we talk about, culture or sexuality, we, it's very useful to get informed in terms of like in Singapore, what's happening. Otherwise, a lot of things that we read, the books that I recommended, for example, uh, is from overseas, right? In the US context, they will talk about First Amendment and things like that, Black Lives Matters. But in Singapore, there are also resources to help us to make sense of it. In fact, the latest regardless uh, article, if you scan the QR code there to bring you to regardless, you would find um, that an analysis about the latest, uh, an article about the, uh, a survey that seemingly, right, uh, the headlines will say that more and more people are receptive, right? That it's okay to let section 377 go, it's okay if you're more liberal. Um, and that article actually unpacks, is the survey legit? You know, what are some of the things to consider? Uh, and things like that. So I would encourage you to also get on regardless. My last slide, I know I've been like flooding you with resources, but if you want to know like where do I even get started, come and be plugged into a community that can help you to journey through the different issues as your child grow up. Okay, I've been in this for 10 years. My children have grown up. Now my children come and speak with me, right? And, and just 
get plugged in and get confident you know in discussing this so we are on telegram you can like us on facebook you can email me text me any way that i can be of service to you i'll be happy to yeah, thank you so much for sharing your wealth of experience uh, in this area so i believe uh, many of us we have benefited from the the uh, our long plus uh, sharing uh, we really thank you uh, carol Okay, so now let's open up uh, this time to uh, any burning uh, questions that you may have. I have some, some questions on Slido. Probably the, the first one. The first one. Yeah. What should I do if I, as a parent, am seen as archaic, bigoted, irrelevant by my children, who is exposed to mainstream acceptance of alternative lifestyle in the name of progression? Okay, so I think there's a few layers to unpack. Firstly, is the child also a follower of Christ? If your child is a follower of Christ, that makes things a little bit easier because then we want to point them back to Christ, right? Mm -hmm. Because that is God's design, that there is a beauty in his design. Mm -hmm. The other thing I want to also say that this word progression comes up quite a bit, right? We are making progress. But I would like to ask, right, we are making progress to what? Just because we are moving doesn't mean we are moving in the right direction, mm. right? It's movement all that is. When we are making progress, we want to ask our children, perhaps it's an older child, right? So, so what do you mean by progress? Progress to what? Does that end? Is it something that enable us to thrive as a nation? Or is there something else, right? Let, let's talk about it. Does it make sense? So because they see that as progress, but helping our children unpack some of these these terms, hopefully mm -hmm. it would then help them to think about their own values, right? What are their values based on? Does that make sense? So, but then if the, the child involved is slipping out, so if it's a Christian, we want to anchor and, and you know, uh, point them back to God, uh, and that's easier because then we have something that is an anchor already. But if it's a child who is uh, who, like me, okay, I fell out of church for 20 years, so in my teenage years, I have my own anchors and I don't I didn't feel that I'm broken. I'm very happy as a atheist married into a Taoist world, but that's a separate story. But what I'm trying to say is that if a child is moving away from God or don't really, is not really convinced that the Bible's way or God's way is correct, then the effort may be not really just talking about sexuality, but how can we win their heart back to God, point them back to the beauty of God? Mm. Does that make sense? So a lot of things that we see surfacing as sexuality issues, many a times if we unpack it further, has got to do with identity, has got to do with what is the basis of their worldview. Mm. And ultimately, the solution would still be, I think we need to anchor them back to God. Does, right. does that make sense? I hope Yes. answers the question. Right. So at the end of the day, uh, like you said, uh, core, the core issue is bringing God into the picture. Right? So I like what you said by uh, at the start is you presented your first slide with love. What is, what is love? What is marriage? And it is like how Christ loved the church. Yeah. So I think for myself, right, if we bring uh, God back into the picture and show our child the vision of uh, healthy and happy marriage, that's my desire even for my children, yeah, for them to remain pure until they walk down the marriage aisle okay, to, to into their marriage huh, and be uh, God pleasing okay, in their in their marriage. Huh. So I think when we bring that back, okay, and then the rest we work towards uh, that goal. Yeah. Okay, so uh are... is it okay if I jump in to answer a sure. question from the Zoom? I think that's a comment that our children are more receptive to outsiders than our parents. I think I was trying to say that, you know, we, we do our best in the family, right? I, I think that's a, that's a very legitimate thing because all that they're consuming on social media and gaming, they are our competitors. Our competitors of our children's time and attention. Mm. Time and attention that we need to anchor them in spiritual discipline, the family culture, you know, and, and unpack things with them. And so how can we make our children more receptive to their parents is actually for us to be good ambassadors of Christ, for us as parents and caring adults to be winsome, right? That we 
present ourselves as another positive influencer in their life that they want to follow, right? How can we stay updated on stuff? How can we be empathetic that is differentiating from their gaming, from their social media, that we have the competitive advantage? We have the physical proximity that with our kids, we can give them a hug, we can look at them in the eye and say, wow, that must be so difficult. Tell me more. Let's go and eat ice cream, shall we? You know, let's go take a walk. We, we are able to do that. But that takes us as parents to slow down, to really listen to them and make time for them. Mm. And so then we can be a good alternative, right? That safe space that young people crave to process some of these complexities. Yeah. Mm. So it boils down to about the relationship, right? Being intentional and, and being uh, patient with them. Okay. Uh, I like this question uh, on age appropriate. So, like for example, if let's say for me, right, having children at 10 to 12, right? For, for me, when I sh show them, when they see the movies, okay, they will yeah, they will see like uh, couples that are not uh, men and women kissing. Okay, and then I will try to unpack it for them. Okay, so these are examples that I use. Is there any other examples where like 10 and 12, other concrete things that we could actually do to, to uh, educate them? Concrete things as in, uh, what are some of the appropriate media, is it? Yeah, like for example, uh, what, what you shared just now about using the matchstick, lighting the matchstick and then putting it in the water. When you light a matchstick, you can't light it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what you taught your daughter. So I thought that was very something very concrete that I can immediately use like tomorrow. Right, right, right. Day, just like a match thing. Yeah. Then I can begin a conversation with my 10-year-old daughter that yes. your virginity is meant for your future husband. Uh, and then you don't Correct. do it otherwise. Yeah. Okay. The bread also. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, uh, so the matchstick one that is actually part of the uh, uh, passport to purity. So there are resources like that. Um, you can find from Crew Media. Uh, they have the passport to purity, and then for the older kids, they have passport to identity. And then there are also many other books that would you know if you uh, I I don't have time to give you like a full mm. list, but you can uh, uh look at Generations of Virtue. Uh, if you go to our website, Generations of Virtue, uh you would be able to find a lot of books that are uh, uh, to teach boys at a certain age or teach girls at a certain age. And those books would have mm. ideas like this. You know, all the ideas about going on a date and all is when I get into this and I read a lot, that's what some of the authors do. And I kind of test it and see whether it works for me. And if it works, then I share with more parents. Uh, so there are a lot of things out there. Once we are willing to learn more about this topic, once we are willing to get our hands and feet wet, mm -hmm in this sea, you know, these waves that are coming at our kids, you find that actually this is how also God teach us. Right? I find that in my own journey, wrestling with this area as my children were growing up, I find that God is revealing himself to me and I find so much more, I grow in my relationship with him more because now I have to find the answers. Hopefully I have the answers to my children's question before they even ask me. So that I can answer with a straight face. But of course, there are questions that come that I cannot answer. Then I will say, that's a very good question. Let me go and find out more about it, right? And then I go and search. I go and ask people, hey, where do I get this? Which is why being in a community is good. And I believe that this is what Aaron's hopes mm -hmm. to do, right? That we build a community for us to wrestle with this together. Because the waves that are coming towards us and our children are strong. But it doesn't mean that we lose hope. Right, there are a lot of resources out there. There are things that we can get anchored and equipped in. Then let's do that as, as a you know a community of parents. There is hope. I really believe so. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Because it takes a village to raise a child. Yeah. So they may be outside with their friends, okay, uh, competing ideologies. But when they come home to this kampong, okay, this community, right, we, we uphold uh, the values uh, in this area. Okay, so uh, probably we can also uh, talk about, like as a parent, sometimes we don't have very good track records ourselves. Okay? Probably we are, have been sexually wayward ourselves. Huh? So given that broken nature, how do we actually expect even our children to remain sexually pure right, and uphold godly values and then so on and so forth? Yeah, how would you address yeah. things like this? Yeah. So, so I, I would um, suggest all of us, at least me included, right, we, we would have certain uh, experiences 
uh, that we have. And sometimes it guilt trips us. But I would like to encourage us as we come before the Lord to ask for repentance, right? God forgives us. Let not the enemy use that as a reason for us not fulfilling our responsibility and authority to raise up his children, right? Rather than letting those baggage that's already passed, we ask for forgiveness. You know, God will create a clean heart within us that we will not do those things again, right? And so let, what if we start afresh and we ask God to help us to cleanse us, ask for his forgiveness, and then we start afresh. We are a new creation. And then with that new revelation and courage, right, and wisdom that we ask from God, when we ask from God, he would give us, right? The Bible says so. Right? And then we journey with our children, right? certain things that we don't know what to say. And if that keeps coming back to us, I think we need to focus back on, you know, God has created in me a new heart. I have asked for a new heart. I've repented. I'm not going to let that weigh me down. That does that make sense? Right? Otherwise, we keep letting our past be that hindrance towards what we should be saying live to our children. Mm. That, does that make sense? We don't have to say 100% every single thing to our young children, especially but I think it's something that we need to wrestle within our mind because I think that's where the enemy will come and say, who are you? Right? How can you do what you want to do? No, no. Mm -hmm. But that is actually the voice of the enemy. We want to focus our eyes on Jesus, right? That we have been redeemed. Let's speak life. Let's speak his word and wisdom to our children. So I got a question here that some of them have a bit of likes. What to do if the child is being laughed at, ridiculed by her friends? Okay, for not agreeing to premarital sex, okay, cohabitation, uh, which is so uh, common uh, in mainstream nowadays, or maybe even cool okay, to have uh, such uh, uh, behaviors and attitudes. Mm. I would ask us, what if our, our kids are laughed at because they are not wearing the latest watch or not bringing the latest bag? Right? It has got to do with also dealing with peer pressure how do we teach our children to deal with peer pressure? Because it can come in different forms, right? Sexuality is just one way. There can be many other things, right? So we want to deal with peer pressure in general to say that, you know, this is, this is what other people believe, right? Our, in our family, we believe in certain things. This is our belief and this is what is best for us. It doesn't matter what people say. We can disagree with them. If they laugh at us, we, we let it slide. We're not going to let it because this is what they believe. It doesn't matter. That doesn't make sense. So it's not just a sexuality issue, actually. It can be many other things, right? Why, why you're not dressing in a certain way? Why you're not, not carrying a certain bag or whatever? Yeah. So it's to, to say that it's okay to be different. As Christians, we are actually different. So to teach our children that it's okay to be different. And then when we feel bad, this is why the safe space in the home is so important, right? That when they deal with all the difficult things, they come back, we reinforce, we pray with them, right? We hug them, we process with them. And then we help them whenever possible to plug them into healthy communities, right? Communities with similar values. Communities that say, you know, it's okay, right? We, let, let's all, you know, work towards what God has for us. What if we can do that? It doesn't mean that we, will, we can shield them for it. That's not shielding. That is actually supporting them, right? Giving them the skills to refuse, giving them the skills to focus on what God's design is. Is that okay? Right, right. Okay. So uh, before I go to DW as a, a very good question, okay, in terms, in line with what you have shared, right? Okay, I, I think there's also this question when it says, uh, how do we balance being strict with pornography? Oh. Yeah, and the child crosses. Because why I asked this is uh, previously I had another family, which I know. Okay, the, the father and mother, they are very strict with media. No movies, right? And um, no, you don't, you don't watch this, don't watch Korean drama. You know, the girls are dressed like that and so on and so forth. Okay? In the end, what the child did was they actually uh, sneakily or secretly watch, okay? Because their friends are watching, okay? And they really desire to watch, but the parents are so strict, okay? In, uh, and and uh, based on good, good reasons, okay? But so in the end, they actually walk, watch it without telling the parents, yeah. So how do we balance it, you know, being open to it and then uh, get, get yeah. upholding the values? Yeah, so I think that's where we want to discuss boundaries with the children, like what is healthy and not healthy for them. Uh, one of the books that I recommended earlier was Mama Bear Apologetics. So in that book, they have a very useful methodology 
uh, or illustration, right? That when our children are growing up in a world that has got so many different kinds of content, we want to teach our children what is good, right? Absorb what is good and reject what is bad. Is what they call a chew and spit <laughs> uh, approach, right? When the children are younger, when we want them to eat fish, right? But fish got bones, right? When they are younger, we will make sure that the bones, we will be the one to make, remove the bones. But when they are older, we need to teach them how to identify that the bone is not good for you and then you don't swallow, right? You need to spit it out. That skill takes time developmentally, okay? So how does it relate to uh, media consumption that's inappropriate, right? We want to build a, a transparent uh, atmosphere in the home so that we are able to articulate to the children why do we have this boundary? Why is it that in our family we don't watch certain things? So if it's pornography, for example, because it tricks our mind. So when I teach the brain defense, this is what I tell the young 9 to 12 year olds, right? Pornography tricks our mind. It, tr it tricks us that you know, people are objects. That is not true, right? So we want to be careful with what uh, we want to watch. But even as I say this, right, I have to say that if children really want to watch something, they will find a way to watch it. Mm. So what I'm trying to say is that ultimately, we need to build that internal filtering and monitoring tool within the kids that they know for themselves, hey, my friend is watching something that I, I, I don't want to watch. Right? Teaching them refusal skills is important. That they themselves know because we can't be with our kids all the time. Mm. So telling, teaching them when they scroll TikTok or whatever and some weird video comes out, even if they watch it, if we have built in that, you know, that anchor, what is God's design, then even if they see it, they are exposed to it, right? It doesn't stick because they know that it's not right. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so, so it's not total protection, right? Because, especially because I don't know what age, uh, you have, when it's younger, for example, the protection needs to be tighter. But when the kids are older, it's just like eating fish. We need to give them the skills to, hey, you know, this is sharp. You don't swallow things that are sharp. So that conversation needs to happen so that ultimately they can eat fish. We don't even need to know whether they are eating fish. We know that they can spit out the bones. Mm. So it's the same thing with media content. That anchor, that skill is really what, do our children understand what does the Bible say? Are they interpreting it correctly? Because now with progressive Christianity, people are interpreting the Bible in different ways also to make it accepting towards certain sexuality approaches. Right, right. Yeah. So I, I think what I hear from you is to build the immunity, you know, this holy immunity in our children as they grow up and then they go out, you know, where the, 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 this virus, so to speak, is everywhere and yet they are immune to it. Yeah, it's like the injection, right? <laughs> well, we all like daily dose, uh, daily quiet time, right? Or weekly family devotion. Uh, vaccination and immunity. Yes, correct. Yeah, that would really yeah. help them to counter any weird stuff that come at them. They yes. would be able to fight it on their own. Mm. So uh, going back to what you said about different interpretations huh, of the Bible, maybe you can uh, answer DW's question. Okay. There's also an idea that conservative sex isn't as cool huh, and enjoyable as liberal idea of sex, huh? more experimental, body confident. Okay? And uh, so how do we uh, respond? Uh, to okay, this? So, so my question is, who are we responding to? Okay, so we, when, when we get a question, when I get a question, right, I, I always want to probe, right, there is a person behind the question, right? There is a questioner behind the question. So who is this person? Is that person a believer? Is that person our child? Is that person a stranger? Because then the way that we approach it, the way that we respond will be different. So if I take this as a child, okay, in my family, who is a Christian, who is following Christ, then my response would be, what do you think, right? Uh, I always ask, what do you think, what, using question to draw up, right? So what do you think? What do you think about what is the biblical? Do, do we know what is God's ideal? So this um, liberal, right? Liberal sex means what, how you can sleep with anybody, right? What, what do you think are the consequences? Is that according to God's design, right? When we are having this liberal sense, which means I can do whatever I want with my body, and then we are bonding with different people. It, what do you think are the consequences? Is that the ideal? Is that the most beautiful thing that God has for us? Okay, if not, then this is just linguistic theft. Okay, in, in Mama Bell Apologetics, they are talking about the power of words, right? Sometimes the meaning of words are stolen, right? It's that liberal, but liberal, is it good? What is the definition of good? 
that is what I would ask if it's an older older person. I would think that this is from an older child, right? So asking questions like this to probe and encourage the young people to think for themselves. But if it's a, a pre-believer, a young person who has different values and different worldview, the conversation will take a very different, will take different um, references because then there is no common anchor, right? But then you can still say that, you know, it's liberal, you can sit with anyone. But what is the consequences? There are health consequences. So in fact, you know, um, this issue about same-sex attraction, transgen transgenderism, it, it is a public health issue in my opinion, because it is dealing, is relating to the health of our young people, not just mental health, mm. right? If they inject things into their body, do top surgery, this, are, this is a <laughs> physical impact on our young people. So, so uh, again, so my in short, right, the response is depending on who that person is, how old that person is, it, do we have a common anchor? And then we adjust that response. But mm -hmm. always in every conversation, be gentle, be respectful, and then nudging them one step at a time closer to what God's standard. That is what I would recommend. So like there's one question, cohabitation does not foster commitment. Oh, Gary can see that, right? Okay. So, but there's no guarantee that a marriage will last forever. Uh, with the increase in the in divorce rates, huh? so we turn left, we turn right, we see divorced families, broken families. Okay, and how do we then convince our children that not not to cohabitate but to pursue a uh, 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 a marriage? Yeah, I and I think the best way to persuade our children is to figure out how are we living our lives. First, are we having a committed marriage uh, with our spouse? And explaining why marriage takes commitment mm -hmm. and what does commitment look like, right? How marriage is not just for ourselves, how marriage is meant to serve others and what, what marriage to God is, right? Is bringing two people together to do things that each one of them cannot do. It's not about me being happy. Then if I'm not happy, then I break up. And then because I have the freedom to do what I want. And so how do we illustrate that, com that commitment is when we role model to our children what commitment is, mm. right? And so when we, again, children, especially young children, right, experiential learning, observing, right? When things are tough, right? When things are tough between me and my husband, for example, we can talk it through, right? We role model our response. You know, I will tell my kids, you know, no matter how, how tough things are, you know, my commitment, I tell myself, divorce is not in my language. Right, I'm not gonna let it, you know, play with the idea. It's like suicide ideation, right? Once that comes in, you play with it. You play with it long enough, it's gonna do something in our heart, right? Mm. So, so it's conversations like that. So first is to demonstrate what marriage is. Again, painting what is the correct way first, right? Then anything else is substandard, right? It's something that is deviating from cohabitation. You test, test what test already. And, and I have got, you know, my girls have got examples from within our networks, you know, friends and relatives, right? Cohabit for a long time. In the end, they, they do not, they, right. they break off. Mm. Who is at the losing end? Actually, if you think about it, mm. got, I'm raising girls, uh -huh. I say, you know, actually, it's the, it's the girls who is at the losing end. You lost how many years of your life thinking that you'll get married. But, you know, in the end, it's the guy who doesn't want to get settled. Okay, of course, it can be the other way around, huh? but uh, that's just what I'm trying to say that, you know, uh, we, we do, especially for us raising girls, right? We, we don't want to be realistic about it, right? You want to test, test, test what? That person is made in the image of God. What do you want to test with that person who is made in the image of God? Does it make sense? So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very, very makes sense. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, let me know this, uh, the, the testing, testing, living together and testing it out. Yeah, I think basically the ideology yeah, in itself is a bit is flawed. Right? Mm. Yeah, the whole setup is not meant to set up for commitment. Right. Where we should be aiming towards commitment. What kind of arrangement help us to learn commitment? I think that's what we're going to uh, aim at. Yeah. Okay, maybe we'll take our last last question. Okay, I got this question in mind. Okay, also the I saw one slide where you said that the uh, the this the sexuality thing is also a slippery slope. How oh, will you will you start with, uh, holding hands right after that, uh, French kissing, or maybe uh, heavy petting, 
and after that, then it goes down and then, then all the way uh, to, to intercourse. Okay, so like masturbation. Okay, so it starts very at the, with the thought. Yeah. Okay, and then you watch the media. Yeah. And then the, the media educate us. Uh, then we went pornography. And then we then masturbation, right? And then so on. So, so it's like the slippery slope. I want to act it out in real life. Yeah. So in terms of masturbation, the Bible doesn't say anything about it. Mm. You Google uh, what is masturbation a sin? Yeah. Or is it good or is it allowable? Right. Health says that health specialist says that it's good for health or blah blah blah. Right. So what is our stand as parents? How do we mm. engage, uh, especially for mm. adolescent children? Right. So I talk about masturbation with my girls in this way that. So firstly, going back to what is God's design for sex. God's design for sex is between a man and a wife, uh, a husband and a wife, for that deep bonding to happen. Okay, so and when, when I talk about pornography with young people, right, it's actually pornography tricks our mind. Pornography tricks our mind is when we are watching something, the brain works in a way that you, it's like you empathize, you are like leaving that out, right? And then we do something to our body to relieve that, that sensation. That actually is, we are bonding to something, but we are bonding to a video or an image, right? We are having sex with ourselves. We, the brain is releasing all these chemicals, but is that the best thing that God has for us? Right? Is that the best? Is that what sex is? Or are we just having sex with ourselves? Is that it? Do we want to just live our life with having sex with ourselves? Is that the union that is meant to be? So is it a sin? Uh, there's no verse that says, right? But is it God's design? I think that is quite clear. Does it make sense? Yeah, so, so is it something that we should encourage? I would say no, because we don't want to bond with an image on the screen. We want to bond with a real person. And the issue with pornography also is that young, young men who are addicted to it, they, they report as having issues with it. They have erectile dysfunction, dysfunction because they are bonding with the image so much when they meet a real person, they are unable because they, their brain is so used to, I need a certain level of high in order to, Whatever, yeah. Mm. Does that make sense? I see. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so Read much. Read about it. In fact, the fight the new drug website. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you very much.